The Holy Gospel according to Matthew 13. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your fields? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The the slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat among them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hello everyone. So good to be with you uh, preaching today and bringing the good news. My name is Pastor Chelsea Globe, and I'm a colleague of Pastor Seth here in the Southwestern Washington Synod of the ELCA. Um, I am coming to you live from my room (laughs) in West Seattle, uh, where I live with my husband, uh, Bill, and my two kids, Jack and Cora. Jack is four and a half, and Cora is just over two, so busy house around here for sure. Uh, I grew up uh, down in Enumclaw, so on the the South Sound end as well, uh, going to Hope Lutheran there. And uh, for the past five years, I served as pastor at Christ Lutheran Church in Federal Way. But starting in this new year, I decided to take some time off and have been on leave from call. So I'm spending some time at home with my kids, uh, which worked out well when all of this whole uh, COVID stuff happened. So just get to be home and and focus on my kids, on my family uh, during this time, which is really wonderful. And I'm really glad to be here with you and kind of jumping back into the saddle of uh, pastoral leadership. So thank you so much for having me here today. Okay, I have a question. Anyone else having some pretty awkward conversations lately? Okay, maybe not just awkward, but um, just really hard conversations. A lot of conflict. Maybe a lot of controversy. It's not just me, is it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it is. Maybe you too have posted something on Facebook thinking it made perfect sense and you're just trying to get some good information out there for your friends only to have someone you know and love respond with such vitriol and disdain that you are left surprised and shocked and a little hurt. Or maybe you've spent some time recently with family or close friends and you make a a comment that seems like an innocent comment or they make a comment and something you thought would just be easy and common sense and It just blows up the whole conversation. Uh, Raise your hand if that's happening to you lately, (laughs) because it has for sure been me and a lot of the people that I know. This is, I think, just a, a symptom of this bizarre time that we are in. 
we were already simmering in a, a cauldron of politics that have pushed us to the extremes of disconnection and not hearing each other. The growing movement to proclaim that black lives matter and indigenous lives matter and police violence and poverty and the growing wealth gap. And this was all before the coronavirus was added on top of that. Now we've got unprecedented levels of stress in our lives, loneliness, hopelessness, fear, exhaustion, decision fatigue, deciding every day what thing is safe or not safe to do. No wonder it's that we are almost coming to blows with each other, online and in our personal relationships over things that we maybe never would have imagined arguing about before. And in these moments, when you are locked in conflict and cannot understand what is going on with that other person and why they would think what they do and you're just pretty sure they have gone off the rails completely and abandoned everything you thought that they believed and held dear and who even is this person anymore? You might be tempted to just say, forget it, forget them, cut them out, pull them up by the roots and toss them in the burn bin. And for sure, there are times when we have to do that in relationships. If a relationship has become abusive in some way or one side has put aside love and respect again and again and again, there are times when you have to decide you might have to let them go, at least for a little while. And I tell you, the unfollow function on Facebook is very helpful for that when it comes to those acquaintances or distant family members, people that you rarely see in real life uh, that you find yourself arguing with online or thinking about later after you've gone to bed, but you think, how could they think that? And what are, what's going on with them? But it's not quite so easy when it comes to those real deep relationships in our lives. Close family members, lifelong friends, mentors, people you've looked up to and respected your whole life. We often can't or, or don't want to. We don't want to cut them out. These are people who are part of our inner circle and they have become part of us. They have made us who we are, shaped and formed and helped us understand and see who we are and what we are to do with this one precious life that we have. So what are we to do with them in this extremely difficult time when we just want to maybe hide under our pillow or set up a beautiful backyard paradise complete with margaritas or pina coladas or whatever your choice? And just forget everything and everyone else. What are we to do? Well, Jesus' story today is actually pretty helpful for us. Just a little recap for you. A farmer sows some wheat in his field, and an enemy sabotages him. So weeds are also sown right into the field, right with the wheat, so that the two plants grow up together side by side. One plant meant for nourishment and sustenance and making a living, and the other, a useless, annoying, perhaps even threatening plant that no one wanted there in the first place. So the farmhands come to the farmer and ask him what to do, and they assume that they need to get rid of the weeds, that they've got to go out and rip them up, get it over with so they aren't a problem later at the harvest. And the landowner surprises them. He says, no, let them grow together. They are too entangled now, too enmeshed with their roots to safely separate. Both would be too damaged in the process. They have to find a way to thrive together, side by side, until the harvest. You probably see where I'm going with this, the lesson this parable has for us today. And you might be thinking, okay, that's great for plants, Jesus, but what about people? What about me and my brother or sister or parent or child or uncle or grandma or best friend or college roommate, etc., whoever we 
may find ourselves in that fight with? How can we thrive and grow side by side when we are feeling diametrically opposed to each other? When we've perhaps said some pretty hurtful things to each other? What might it look like to thrive and grow alongside those who feel like the weeds in the garden of our lives? Well, if we look at our story here, we've got a couple of good clues for us. Number one, stay calm. Notice the farmer. He doesn't explode and rage and run out to get revenge. He calmly notices the situation. An enemy has done this, is all he says. He stays grounded. He doesn't lash out. He assesses the situation, looks at the whole big picture, and decides what's the best thing to do. In leadership studies, they sometimes call this getting on the balcony. You have to imagine yourself looking at a situation up above so you can see the whole big picture and all the different facets at play as an observer. Even if it's something that you are deeply involved in or very emotionally involved in, it's got its emotional hooks in you, stop for a moment and try to get on the balcony. Try to take in the whole picture. Yes, there's the crazy thing your dad or your aunt or your cousin or your longtime friend said, but there's also a pandemic, quarantine, isolation, fear, loneliness, uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of which mean that none of us are operating at our best right now. You got to see the whole picture to stay calm. And that leads us to number two, suspend judgment. That's a hard one. We like to judge, right? Why else do we gossip or read People magazine or watch reality television or even the nightly news? Humans like to judge. It helps us feel better about our current state. If we can find things wrong with others, then there must be things that are right with us. But in Jesus's parable, the farmer decides to put aside judgment for a moment. It won't be helpful for him to call out the wheat from the weeds in that moment until he puts it off for a later time. We, as Christians, are called to suspend judgment as well. It is not us who get to decide who is wheat and who is a weed. Now imagine how some of these hard conversations might go differently if we took off our judgment hat and instead put on our curiosity hat. What would happen if we asked why someone thinks or believes or does what they do? When we stop to ask the deeper questions, putting aside our need to judge and our need to be right in the moment, we are often surprised at the answers we find and maybe even realize that our judgments were wrong in the first place. You also have to be willing to say this, and and this is a hard one too. I could be wrong about this. Practicing that kind of humility, especially within conflict, is never easy. But it's pretty amazing how quickly it can help put the other person down from their defenses. As soon as you say, yeah, I, this is what I think, and I might be right, I might be wrong about it. That definitely helps put someone off their guard. And a third thing we learn from Jesus' parable today is that we must remember always, always, that we are all in God's hands. God, who is the, the primary and first gardener and farmer, the creator of us all, creator of even those with whom we disagree, 
We are all allowed and called and asked to grow and flourish in whatever way we choose. And thank God for that. Because that means that even when we are the ones being real weedy, when we have weeds of hate or judgment or fear growing in our hearts, God still calls us and names us beloved and worthy and enough. God's created spirit, after all, is still at work within us, within those we love, within those we disagree, tilling the rich soil that will feed God's kingdom among us. So it's not easy to thrive and grow alongside wheat and weeds. We would so much rather just be right. Just pull up the weeds and throw them out. Know that we are right and good and noble and safe. But remember, that person you're fighting with isn't a weed. They are a beloved, beautiful child of God, just like you. If we extend that respect to those we love, and ask for and get it in return, we could truly change the entire discourse in this country. Maybe that is the job of the church in this day and age, to realize that we do have within us the power to heal those broken relationships, to mend our broken hearts, to sit in the same room with all our disagreements and our opposite opinions and still be able to say, I love you and I care about you and I want to understand you. (sighs) Jesus today is telling us we've got to leave the judgment out. It is not up to us. And thanks be to God for that. (laughs) Amen.